Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it is all about the Earth's resources. This topic involves looking into how we get our water from our planet and also some of the materials that we use in everyday life. At the start of the Earth's resources topic, we look at water and how we get water safe to drink. Water that is safe to drink is also known as potable water. But just because that water is safe to drink does not mean that it is pure water. It's actually a mixture. It contains many different ions, sometimes useful ions which your body uses, uh, such as fluoride, uh, which is added to water because it is good for your teeth. Pure water can be made though, and pure water means that the water uh, only contains H2O. There will be no minerals or ions present. Now, how we get our water in the UK? We usually collect it from lakes and reservoirs but in this state it's not safe to drink this water is dirty water and we need to do some treatment to it in order to make it safe to drink the first thing we do is filter it and that is to remove solid uh, impurities then after we have filtered it we will sterilize that water and to do that, we usually add a halogen uh, such as chlorine and some UV light and that will kill off harmful microorganisms and bacteria that you do not want in your water. After being sterilized, the water is then distributed to all parts of the country. Now it does contain um, some minerals that are dissolved into that water. And the more minerals that are dissolved in that water can define that water as being hard or soft water. Hard water has more minerals dissolved in it. In hot countries where the water supply might not be as plentiful as the UK and they can't use lakes and reservoirs in order to collect the water, what they sometimes do is use salt water collected from the sea and do a process called distillation uh, in which they heat up that water to evaporate uh, water leaving the salt behind and the water condenses in the condensation tube and you collect pure water. Now once you've collected this pure water they actually have to add the minerals to it in order to make it safe to drink because pure water in its purest sense is actually not that good for you. They need to add the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium ions into that water to make it safe to drink. Also distillation is quite an expensive process and is not that great for the environment as heat has to be added and as you know heat requires a lot of energy to create. So it's preferable that we collect our water from lakes and reservoirs. As well as looking at how we get our water to drink in this topic we also look at how we treat our wastewater in the UK about 11 billion liters of wastewater is created each year and that needs to be treated in order to not contaminate all the pure water resources that we have already and make sure we do not pollute all of our river ecosystems the first step in wastewater treatment is screening and this screening process removes all of the solids. Once the water has been screened it's sent to the primary settling tank. And in this the water is moved round incredibly slowly and the reason why it moves round slowly is so that the remaining solids uh, settle to the bottom and there is also a arm that comes around the top of the primary settling tank which removes uh, a lot of the fats and oils which float to the top. In the secondary settlement tank 
useful bacteria is used and the useful bacteria will feed on the microorganisms that are present in the wastewater and can make it a lot more safe to be returned into the rivers. Now, as well as the useful bacteria being in there, they also add oxygen, uh, which is used to breed these useful bacteria. These bacteria thrive on the oxygen and um, that, that's how they survive basically. In the last final treatment stage, the water is either just returned in back into the river if it's completely fine and it's been tested, or it can be filtered one more time just to remove any really tiny solids uh, that might still be in that water. Um, here I've got a picture of a wastewater treatment plant. And it's actually really good because you can actually see some of the tanks that are present here. You can see the primary settlement tanks here uh, with the large arm that goes around collecting the oils and fats over the top. And here you have the secondary settlement tanks. And you can tell it's a secondary settlement tank because of all the bubbles that have come to the surface, changing that water's colour. In addition to this, you can also see some of the useful byproducts made from wastewater treatment. The sludge that is collected can actually be kept in these silos and these silos can store all the waste products, the, uh, the large solids that, that have been removed and that can be uh, turned into fertilizers which can be spread on farms. Also you can collect biogas which can be used as fuels from wastewater treatment as well. Now that is what you call poo power. Now we've looked at water, how we get our water, how we treat our water once we've used it. We're going to look at other materials that we use and collect from the earth now. And there are two types of resource that you need to know about. And the first one is a finite resource. And that means that it will eventually run out. And an example would be coal, which is a fossil fuel. And nearly all fossil fuels are finite. And the reason why they're finite is because they were created such a long time ago and uh, they are not being replenished at the same rate as what they are being used. And the opposite of finite is renewable. And a renewable resource is one that can be replenished. And an example of a renewable resource is wood, okay? Because you could just plant more trees if you used wood as a fuel or use wood to make chairs out of, it's one that can be replenished. Now a lot of the products that we use today can be found in nature and are known as natural products because they occur naturally. However, the problem with natural uh, products is when you need them on a large scale, often you need to farm large areas and it's not a sustainable way of doing it. So often natural materials are made synthetically and that means they're made in a laboratory using chemicals. An example is down here, I've got silk that's been made by a silkworm, which is obviously the natural product. However, silk is required on such a large scale that it's often synthetically produced on a massive scale uh, in order to produce enough to meet the global demand. When looking at whether we're going to use a natural or synthetic product, what we probably will use is something called a life cycle assessment, which evaluates all of the impacts on the environment the product has. The cycle assessment will take into account the extraction, the manufacture, the distribution, the use of the product and the recycling and disposal of that product. Down here I have two ducks. I have one that's a rubber duck and one that is a wooden duck. Now if I was to do a life cycle assessment of both these products, I would need to consider all of these factors that I've just discussed. So if I was to do a life cycle assessment of this rubber duck, um, I'd probably find that it was extracted from crude oil as it is plastic and crude oil extraction happens underneath ground it's often quite a lot of energy needed uh, to drill that far down and the manufacture of it will involve uh, separating that crude oil maybe by fractional distillation and 
also then uh, heating in order to make the polymer that's needed. Distribution, it depends where that uh, rubber duck is made. Now, a lot of plastics that we get in the UK are shipped over from abroad, so it will take into account the shipping of that product for distributing. Now, it's use and management. Environmental fact, uh, factors can also take into account whether uh, there is any impact on the environment whilst it's in use. And a lot of plastics will uh, put into our environment something called microplastics uh, when they come into contact with water. And this can have a bad environmental effect because of the fact um, plastics get into the seawater and get eaten by fish and there is a plastic accumulation in the sea. Often as well, these plastics cannot be recycled. Uh, so when they're disposed of, they usually end up in landfill and are not biodegradable. Now, if I'm to do the same thing with this wooden duck, I will find that it's made of chopping down trees, so it comes from wood. The manufacture might involve some sawing and um, might involve some waste of wood. Um, but it won't have too much impact on the environment. Distribution, um, now often it might still involve some distribution, so that, that would also take into account shipping of that product. The use management, now wood is quite um, good for the environment. In fact, once it's being made, uh, it's not going to have too much impact on the environment. So this one is going to have uh, not much impact during the use maybe if it breaks okay and you needed to get it fixed for example if one of the legs fell off uh, maybe it's not very durable and you need to replace one of the legs obviously that needs to be taken into consideration then the recycling of and disposing of the product well wood is biodegradable so it could degrade so if i'm to look at the two life cycle assessments one of the plastic duck and one of the Wooden duck, I'd probably say the wooden duck has a better life cycle assessment. However, life cycle assessments don't take into uh, fact uh, the economic uh, considerations that are needed to be taken into account. Uh, rubber ducks might be cheaper to produce than wooden ducks. If a product can be recycled, then it will significantly decrease the amount of effect that that product has on its environment. Through recycling, you reduce the amount you need to you need to mine. You also reduce the amount of landfill you produce, and you also reduce the amount of energy of a whole process. Because we looked at the life cycle of um, different products on the last slide. And we saw that it, even transport and things like that has to be taken into consideration when assessing a life cycle assessment and it would reduce that by recycling it. Recycling does have some drawbacks though. Uh, it often requires um, some energy as you need to heat up the product before molding it into a new shape. So it does have a few drawbacks. And that's why we also need to look at reducing the amount of waste we produce and reusing products as well as recycling. If you're a foundation tier student, well done. This video is finished for you. If you are a higher tier, there is just a little bit more to go for you. And what we're gonna look at now is extracting metals, how we collect the metals that we use, okay? I know this crops up also in chemical changes. We look at uh, electrolysis in order to collect metals, and we also look at displacement. However, you in this topic, we only look at really the extraction of copper and a couple of different methods that we might not have explored before. When you have a copper rich or meaning that the ground contains lots of copper, what you will do is you'll use a technique called smelting. And smelting requires lots of energy as it's constant heating and cooling. And this concentrates the copper that is inside that ore. And then the copper is purified further by adding uh, sulfuric acid to it 
which turns it into copper sulfate and the copper sulfate can be collected by electrolysis. You've seen this technique before, so I'm not going to go into detail in explaining it. But when you don't have copper in such a high concentration, if you have uh, quite a poor ore, so an ore that's not containing too much copper, um, then you would use two techniques maybe called phytomining and bioleaching. And what phytomining does, it involves planting uh, different plants and trees in areas where there is not that much copper but what it does is that plant will take in the minerals from the soil it will take in the copper and what you can do is you can burn the plant and you can collect the copper uh, from the ash maybe using a technique of adding sulfuric acid and then electrolysis obviously that contains less um, energy than smelting so so that's another way of looking uh, at more sustainable technique of extracting copper and the other way is using a technique called bioleaching which is like phyto uh, phytomining but instead it involves bacteria. Now that is the end of today's video looking at the earth's resources. If you like the video please drop it a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.